Okay, so this is our um, continuing discussion of Simon Don's individuation in the light of notions of form and information. We're starting, well, actually, this is a, a bit of a difficult point because there's a discrepancy between the English and the French on this point. But um, in the, the French, in, in my edition, this is a separate part of the book on on vital individuation, on a, sorry, on psychical individuation. Whereas in the English, um, he's put psychical individuation and, and co collective individuation as chapters under under vital individuation. And I'm not really sure why he's done that unless he looking at a different edition, possibly in, in the French, but I don't think there's another, I don't think there's a, a different edition of the full text so yeah, it's a sort of a strange translation choice or formatting choice of the of the translation. But in any case, we're starting on psychical individuation. Uh, what we've read up to now on on so the introduction and then the physical individuation part and the vital individuation. So that's that's the part that was published first. Uh, so the the whole thing was was uh, the whole book that we're reading was Simon Don's habilitation thesis. Then. The, the first two parts were published together in 1960, I believe, or thereabouts. Uh, then the, the remainder of, of the thesis, so the parts we're about to start now, psychical individuation and collective individuation, were published only uh, in 1989, which I believe was also the year that Simon Don died. I'm not sure if he was involved in that publication or if it was after his death. Uh, it's only in 2005 that the the whole thing was published together as one uh, as one book um, plus uh, some certain uh, certain other texts that are related to the the topic of uh, of individuation and that's those texts are included in volume two of the translation the stuff that we've read so far is basically what the book looked like to readers in the in the 60s so uh, when when the list starts taking up some of Simon Don's concepts um, it's the part that we've read so far, plus the conclusion that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, yeah, so we've, we've read everything that was released at that time that was uh, available um, to the, the public at that time. So specifically on last week, what we saw was the, the notion of uh, information, uh, Simon Don's development of, of a, a different conception of information, um, and we'll see more on that the, this week and, and probably next week as well. He, he starts by contrasting this notion of information with the um, information theoretical notion of information or, or the communication theory notion of information, which is a, a quantitative one, according to which information is inversely correlated with probability. So the, the less probable a message is or the less predictable a message is, the more information it carries. So this this notion of information is is very useful in uh, you know t various technical fields of that involve transmission of information in some way. So telephones, television, uh, you know these days, um, you know internet communications of, of various kinds. But uh, it also has some sort of paradoxical properties or some counterintuitive consequences, I guess you could say. So. Simon Don points out that a picture of a, a pile of sand actually carries a lot more information in this sense than a picture of a, a rectangle or a square or something like that. A picture of a, a, a simple geometrical shape is something that you can transmit very simply. You can just specify it's a square uh, with a side of three centimeters or something like that. So you can, you can transmit it with a very small amount of information. Whereas the picture of a pile of sand, you have each individual grain of sand has a, a specific location in the picture, and that makes it uh, each 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 individual grain of sand has to be transmitted separately. Uh, so this is sort of counterintuitive. What what seems like a completely random and uninformative picture of of just a grain of sand or or of a, a pile of sand or something like that uh, carries a lot more information than what seems more uh, significant or more valuable, like a, a, a simple geometrical shape. And so this this sort of um, paradox or counterintuitive consequence is is part of what leads Simon Don to suggest this alternate notion of information or this uh, something underlying the standard notion of information from information theory, which is what he calls here signification. So uh, this is the capacity of a of a message or a signal to elicit some sort of response in the receiver 
And uh, and so here, the the message has to be something that the receiver is capable of uh, incorporating into its functioning in some ways, so whether it's a, a technical receiver, like a, a recording mechanism or something like that, or it's a, a human being uh, at the end of a uh, of a telephone uh, signal or something like that. Either either way, we can look at the way that the message is incorporated into the functioning of the receiver. Uh, and so th there has to be um, there has to be a certain amount of difference uh, between uh, a certain uh, unpredictability. Uh, so if the message is completely predictable, then there's no point transmitting the message in the first place. But it also can't be completely um, unpredictable. It can't be just completely disjointed from anything that the the receiver already has uh, available in its um, functioning. It has to have some sort of connection to the, the receiver's functioning in order for it to be incorporable, I guess we can say. So this means that there, the, there's a, a notion of what Simon Don called disparation. Um, so there's a, a, a difference, a constitutive difference between the, the state of the receiver and the the message um, that is uh, being transmitted. And, and this difference underlies the possibility of something like uh, transmission of information in the first place. This, uh, we'll see more on this today and, and uh, in the next couple of weeks as we go through the part on psychical individuation. But this notion of information, whenever Simon Don talks about information, we should, well, he, he's not 100% rigorous in his his terminology here, but when he, when he talks about information, we should generally think of this more fundamental notion of information that underlies the possibility of transmitting a signal. And then specific, when he specifically talks about the information theoretical notion of information, he will generally use the term information signal or, uh, or something similar. That's what we saw last week. And then the last bit uh, before we get started uh, for this week's reading, the last bit was on um, topology, uh, this notion of uh, a topological structure to a living being. Uh, and, and so a living being is structured in such a way that it has a, an inside and, and an outside. It, uh, it's, it forms a, a sort of boundary between an inside and an outside. And we can, we can classify living beings by their uh, different degrees of interiority and exteriority. So within very simple organisms, uh, like a, a, a bacterium or something like that, there, there's just the one boundary between inside and outside. Uh, and then in more complex or more differentiated organisms, there are different uh, degrees of inside and outside. So we have the, the interior of a digestive system or, or digestive uh, tube in, inside an organism, which acts as a, a relative exterior for the, or, the rest of the organism. Uh, and then we have, say, the, the bloodstream uh, serves as the exterior for the various glands that secrete uh, different substances into the bloodstream. A living being is a sort of hierarchy of different levels of interiority and exteriority. Uh, and, and that's uh, that's Simon don't suggest that this is a way we can actually classify living beings in terms of their sort of uh, structure of interiority and exteriority. Uh, and then uh, the sort of sketches, it's, it's rather um, quick, but he, he sketches an idea of form of time that would correspond to topology. Uh, so in the same way that topology has to do with space, but understood in terms of order relationships rather than metric relationships in in chronology we would have a, a a sort of notion of time from that that is underlies the or is prior to a notion of a length of time uh, or a, a, a metric on time and so Simon don't suggest that genesis in the the specific sense that he uses the term here is is sort of this common commonality or, or this common root of chronology and topology uh, so it, it's this underlying um, non-metric ordering relationship that's common to both the, the domain of topology and the domain of, of chronology. Okay, and then there's a, there's a question in the chat here um, from Luno. Uh, so the question is, is signification being used similarly as uh, when Lacan says signification, like the production of meaning in the imaginary? My knowledge of Lacan is pretty limited, uh, so I can't say for sure. But my my sense is that this is a bit of a different notion of signification. So it, it's not primarily uh, well. So my understanding 
is there for Lacan's signification has to do with uh, linguistic meaning uh, primarily. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but for Simon Don, it's it's not specifically linguistic meaning that he's talking about. Its uh, uh, signification has an ontological sense, really, for Simon Don. It's it's this capacity for a system to undergo transformation as a result of receiving some sort of structural condition from without, which uh, in the case of the uh, technical object would be a, a message transmitted. Yeah, I, I would hesitate to be sort of um, too decisive, I guess, on that question, because as I said, I, I, I don't know Lacan that well. But yeah, so Angus has, has mentioned the, the example, one of the examples that Simon Don gives of signification is um, two pendulums uh, that synchronize with each other uh, and and the conditions under which that synchronization can happen. So this is clear, clearly a, a non-linguistic uh, example of, uh, of signification. Uh, and, and so it uh, suggests that, or it, it yeah, it, it suggests that there is a, a a different notion of signification at work here than in Lacan. Uh, right. So I'll start. Um, I'll I'll start with uh, the chapter, um, and then we'll go around as usual. As I mentioned, this is a in the French version. This is a, a part, not a chapter. So the the part is entitled "Psychical Individuation," and then the the chapter uh, is "Signification and the Individuation of Perceptive Units." Uh, and then we have the section heading, Segregation of Perceptive Units, the Genetic Theory and the Theory of Holistic Grasping, Determinism of Good Form. From the outset, a problem of individuation can be defined relative to perception and knowledge taken in their totality. Without prejudging the nature of perception, which can be considered as an association of elements of sensation or as the grasping of a figure on the ground, it is possible to contemplate how the subject perceives separate objects and not a confused continuum of sensations and how it perceives objects as having an already given and consistent individuality. The problem of the segregation of units is solved neither by associationism nor by Gestalt psychology, since the, the former does not explain why the individualized object possesses an internal coherence, a substantial bond that gives it a veritable interiority that cannot be considered the result of association. Habit, which is then invoked to guarantee the coherence and unity of perception, is in fact a dynamism that can communicate to perception only what it possesses by itself, namely this temporal unity and continuity inscribed in the object as a static unity and static continuity of the perceptum. Associationism, which is the genetic theory of pure appearance, involves the recourse to habit, or more indirectly, a link of resemblance or analogy, i.e. a dynamism grasped statically, and in fact borrows from a hidden innateism. Association alone, the contiguity, was not able to explain the internal coherence of the object individualized in perception. The latter would remain a mere accumulation of elements without cohesion, without mutual attractive force, and these elements would remain partes extra partes relative to one another. But the perceived object doesn't merely have the unity of a sum or a result passively constituted by a vis a tergo, i.e. habit and the series of repetitions. Far from being passive, the perceived object has a dynamism that allows it to transform without losing its unity. It, not, it has not only a unity, but also an autonomy and a relative energetic independence that renders it a system of forces. Gestalt theory has replaced the genetic explanation of the segregation of perceptive units with an innateist explanation. Unity is grasped immediately by virtue of a certain number of laws, like the laws of pregnancy or of good form. And this psychological phenomenon shouldn't be surprising insofar as the living world with its organisms and the physical world in general manifest phenomena of totality. Um, and I'll just note here that the, uh, the footnote here is a, a long one that is probably worth digging up if someone has the PDF uh, open and, and uh, wants to post it in the, the chat. Seemingly inert matter contains the virtuality of forms. A supersaturated solution or a liquid in a state of supercooling will allow crystals to appear whose form is predestined in the amorphous state. However, Gestalt theory leaves an important problem up for debate, which is precisely that of the genesis of forms. If form were truly given and predetermined, there would be no genesis, plasticity, or uncertainty relative to the future of a physical system, an organism, or a perceptive field. Uh, sorry, relative to the future of a physical system, an organism, or a perceptive field. But this is precisely not the case. 
There is a genesis of forms just as there is a genesis of life. The state of the entelechy is not fully predetermined in the bundle of virtualities that precede and preform it. What Gestalt theory and, and associationism both lack is a rigorous study of individuation, i.e. this critical moment when unity and coherence appear. A veritable sense of totality forces us to assert that Gestalt theory does not consider the absolute ensemble. In the physical world, the absolute ensemble is not just the solvent and the dissolved body. It is the solvent, the dissolved body, and the uh, ensemble of forces and potential energies characterized by the word metastability, which is indicative of the state of the supersaturated solution at the moment when crystallization takes place. In this moment of metastability, there is no determinism of good form that can sufficiently predict what occurs. Phenomena such as epitaxy show that at the critical instant, the moment when the potential energy is maximum, there is a sort of relative indetermination of the result. The presence of the smallest external crystalline germ, even the presence of another chemical species, can then initi initiate crystallization and orient it. Before the appearance of the first crystal, there is a state of tension that leaves a considerable amount of energy available for the slightest local accident. This state of metastability is comparable to a state of conflict in which the instant of highest uncertainty is precisely the most decisive instant, the source for determinisms and genetic sequences that find their absolute origin in this instant. In the living world, a genesis of forms takes place that supposes a calling into question both of prior forms and their adaptation to the vital milieu. Not every transformation can be considered a genesis of form because a transformation can also be a degradation. Um, let's stop here because this is a multi-page paragraph again. Uh, so the, as the, the title indicates, the title of the, the chapter, um, the, the question for this chapter has to do with individuation in perception. So the, the, the problem of how is it the case or, or why is it the case that um, in perception we perceive individual objects uh, or something that has the status or the, the role of an individual rather than just say a, a series of colored points or, or uh, a series of random sounds or something like that. Uh, and so Simon Dome is going to criticize uh, two, the two sort of leading theories of, of the time uh, in psychology, which are the associationist and the Gestalt uh, schools. And uh, yeah, so Angus has, has posted in the chat here about uh, the way that atomism, uh, sorry, associationism is a kind of atomism of perceptive units, uh, whereas the Gestalt theory um, has a, uh, an account uh, on which you have forms of perception that uh, sort of unify um, what is, what's given in perception. And, and he, uh, Angus is comparing this to the, the discussion of atomism and hylomorphism that we've seen throughout the, the book, and especially in the introduction um, many months ago now. So yeah, I think that, that comparison is probably right. So yeah, so the associationist theory is um, this sort of standard empiricist uh, approach that tries to um, that tries to build up complex phenomena from simple parts um, by means of uh, laws of association. Uh, so you have laws of uh, contiguity uh, in space or time, uh, similarity. I forget all the, the different laws that they proposed, but uh, the idea is that there there are these simple laws uh, or uh, these laws that associate different um, perceptive elements together, uh, so that when 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 you perceive A followed by B, you uh, you, you tend to have uh, some sort of perceptual link between A and B. So if you see A in the future, you'll you'll expect B to to come uh, immediately after or something like that. Uh, whereas for Gestalt psychology. Uh, so the Gestalt psychology proposes uh, a notion um, in which there are these uh, forms of perception, so these good forms, uh, as they put it. Uh, so there's um, geometrical figures, for example, uh, uh, that have a certain stability uh, in perception. So that, as, so as Simon Dahl will, will mention a bit later in, in this section for today, uh, if you have a, a drawing, say, of a, of a triangle, or a circle, then and and you you put a bunch of other lines over top of it. The the triangle, the circle, still sort of stands out from the other lines. It uh, it it's still um, easily perceivable. 
uh, and even you can even cover portions of the of a triangle and you you sort of um you sort of reconstruct the the remainder of the triangle um uh, behind the the obstacle and, and so these are sort of two opposed theories right yeah and so this this optical illusion uh the Kinesa triangle i believe it's called um uh is one where you uh yeah so you see a, a white triangle even though there's actually no lines drawing the triangle uh you you sort of um you see it as if it's a white triangle over top of three black circles even though what's really on the page or on the screen here is um circles with a little piece cut out of them you sort of impose the form on onto the the image uh and and see it a a, a triangle over top uh and so this is these types of optical illusions are were like a, a staple of gestalt psychology oh yeah and and luno has also posted the a list of the uh principles of association so uh, yeah thanks for that and and so Simon Don uh, argues that both of these theories uh, are sort of missing a notion of individuation in perception. So either way, so either if you think that the um, if you think that the the individual object is sort of built up out of uh, components, or if you think that there's a kind of uh, form that that uh, uh, form of the whole that is sort of governs the uh, the structure of perception. Uh, either way, you're not really describing the appearance or the coming into being the, the genesis of the form in perception. It's that moment of um, the appearance of, of the form, uh, the appearance of the individual object uh, that Simon Don wants to um, isolate and, and focus on. In, in the case of uh, associationism, what, what Simon Don criticizes is the way that it's um, it, it seems to uh, sort of dissolve the object into its parts, or it doesn't. It doesn't really um, give us an account of what the the object as a, a unit or as an individual consists in. So we just have uh, you know perception of red, and uh, next to perception of uh, black, say we we. Uh, in some in some mysterious way, we we form a, a notion of say a red object in front of a, a black background, and uh, we we can sort of isolate the red uh, from the the black. But there's no there's no um, account of how we actually uh, do that isolating process of how we um, how the the red object comes to be uh, seen as uh, something in front of a a black background and uh, something individuated in that sense. The the sort of converse error or the converse problem uh, for Gestalt, Gestalt psychology is that it um, it sort of get, makes the forms uh, forms of perception given at the beginning. So there the forms already pre exist uh, and there's no actual. Um, uh, genesis or or coming into being of the forms in perception. So there's there's a certain determinism about it, so that you can uh, sort of predict in advance what the the perceptual form is going to be. And Simon Don uh, argues that this is not in fact the case. So that there there is some sort of indeterminacy in perception, uh, uh, and uh, and this shows that there's an actual process of coming into be or a, a genesis of form rather than forms all being pre-given at the start or, or before the perception actually happens. Um, and then, so Luno has a question in the chat again. So um, ultimately, Simon Don feels that association and gestaltism, associationism and, and gestaltism uh, do not explain why the object must appear in this way to perception necessarily. I think, I don't think that's exactly what the, the issue is that Simon Don has with, with both of these accounts. I think I think the the issue has to do um, has to do with the quality of um, coming into be uh, that's associated with um, with perceptual form. So uh, it's perceptual form is not something that's given at the outset of perception or, or before perception. It's something that uh, appears in perception. Uh, so in the process of perceiving something, we come to we come to perceive it as having a certain form uh, and having a, a, an individuation. Um, uh, and, and 
so for him, the the two accounts um, sort of fail on opposite in opposite directions to account for individuation. Um, uh, so associationism, it it sort of remains below the level of, of uh, individuation because it, it always just deals with parts added to each other, uh, and it can never it can never give an account of how those parts come to be. Uh, join together and form a, a unit, a form a, an individual. Uh, whereas in the case of uh, Gestalt psychology, it remains sort of um, at the level above the individual. So it, it starts from the whole. Um, the the whole is given from the outset uh, of of the perceptual situation, and uh, and then there's only. Um, the whole process of perception is is just a a sort of um, working out of those pre-given forms, uh, and and it's completely predictable in that sense. So Simon Don wants wants to have a notion of uh, perceptual um, perceptual individuation or or the individual the perception of an individual. Um, he wants to have a notion uh, in which. The, the perception of the individuation, uh, uh, sorry, the perception of the individual would be an individuating perception. So it's a, a perception undergoing a process of individuation. And so it, it doesn't uh, rely on forms that are given before perception. Uh, it's the forms themselves are generated in perception. So that might be a little bit uh, unclear exactly what that means at this point, but uh, hopefully as we go along, it'll... Um, Start to become a bit more clear, uh, um, but we can we can already see he's um, he's pointing back towards the the example from <coughs> sorry the example um, from the part on physical individuation about crystallization. So in the same way that the supersaturated solution um, turns it turns into the crystal or the the crystalline structure appears in the supersaturated solution. Uh, likewise, the forms in perception sort of crystallize out of um, something that is not individuated or, or not formed in that sense um, prior to perception. Uh, so we'll see more on on uh, how that process of crystallization or, or the, the generation of form uh, is supposed to happen. Uh, we can go on, I think, to the next bit, uh, the next page or so, if someone else would like to read from uh, the top of 259. Um, I can read. When crystals form, erosion, abrasion, crumbling, and cal calcination modify the crystal's form, but they are not in general genesis, genesis of form. Some consequences of the form generated during crystallization can remain, such as, for example, the privileged directions of the cleavage due to the crystal's reticular structure, uh, which consists of a large number of elementary crystals. But then we are observing a degradation of form and not a genesis of forms. In the same way, not all the transformations of a living species can be interpreted as genesis of forms. There is a genesis of forms when the relation of a living ensemble to its milieu and to itself passes through a critical phase, rich in tensions and virtuality, a phase that ends with the disappearance of the species or the appearance of a new life form. The situation in its entirety is constituted not only by the species in its milieu, but also by the tension of the ensemble formed by the relation of the species to its milieu, wherein the relations of incompatibility become increasingly strong. Moreover, the species isn't the only thing that is modified, for the entire ensemble, the vital complex formed by the species in its milieu also discovers a new structure. Finally, in the psychological domain, the ensemble in which perception takes place, in which following Kurt uh, Lewin, I think, um, can be called the psychological field, is constituted not just by the subject in the world, but also by the relation between the subject and the world. Lewin um, indeed says that this relation with its tensions, conflicts, and incompatibilities is integrated into the psychological field. But according to our theory, this is precisely where Gestalt theory reduces two terms to two terms, what is an ensemble of three independent or at least very distinct terms. It is only after perception that tensions are effectively incorporated into the psychological field and become part of its structure. Before perception, there is the genesis, oh, sorry. Before 
perception before the genesis of the form that perception precisely is, the relation of incompatibility between the subject and the milieu only exists as a potential, similar to the forces that exist in the phase of metastability of the supersaturated solution or the supercooled solid, or even in the phase of metastability of the relation between a species and its milieu. Perception is not the grasping of a form, but the resolution of a conflict, the discovery of a compatibility, the invention of a form. This form that perception is modifies not only the relation between the object and the subject, but also the structure of the object and the structure of the subject. Like all physical and vital forms, it is susceptible to degrading. And this degradation is also a degradation of the whole subject because each form is part of the subject's structure. Um, so here he, he's talking about how, how we have the um, possibility for transformations that are, are not the genesis of form. So in the case of crystals, uh, we have the actual genesis of the crystal in the first place. Um, but we also have, uh, once the crystal is already formed, we have the possibility of, for the crystal to undergo various transformations like uh, erosion, abrasion, crumbling, etc. We also have, in, in the same way we have in the case of um, uh, living beings, we have uh, the possibility of uh, a, a transformation that is not um, necessarily not necessarily a, a genesis of form and uh, likewise in in perception or in psychical individuation in general uh, and then he um, he goes on to suggest that in in the case of the the psychological fields um, or in the case of uh, psychical individuation um, what we have is um, is not just the the subject and the object, but we also have this relation between subject and object. So there's a, a three-way um, or a three-term uh, uh, operation or, or the field has three terms in it. What, what happens in the, the, the action of perception is precisely that the, there's a, a sort of um, incorporation of um of the terms together into uh uh yes that that's a, a good way of putting it 61 so perception uh here is is conceptualized as a discovery of a compatibility and discovery uh dis we can also read discovery as an invention because it's not something that pre-exists to the actual discovery itself uh so it's not it's not that the compatibility exists and then in perception we we find that uh, pre-existing compatibility it's it's that what what is given to us uh to the to the subject is uh is a problem uh and uh the compatibility is the solution to the problem so finding a way to fit everything together and uh produce something like an object is is the task that um, we have in front of us as subjects uh right yes yeah, so there's a a sense in which the um in perception, we so both both the relationship uh, between uh, subject and object, and the subject and the object themselves undergo uh, a transformation in the in in the action of perception. So uh, the the perceived object as such, so the the perceived object insofar as it is perceived, undergoes a, a transformation and becomes uh, uh, an individual, whereas before it was. Um, maybe a collection of parts or uh or even prior to that it, it was just a, a a problem for the perceptual situation yeah so that's that's sort of the uh picture of perception that we we should be thinking of here as a perception as an invention or discovery of a compatibility oh and as for the uh the question about how to pronounce the name here um so i'm not 100 percent sure if he so he was German, but moved to the U.S. and and worked in the U.S. And I'm not sure if he kept the German pronunciation of his name or not. But in in German, it would be Kurt Leven. Sorry, I um, just figured he looked like a Lewin to me. I don't know. But what what about that last bit about the degradation and the possibility of degradation? Uh, right. Yes. Um. So I think uh I think we'll see more on this later. Um, but the the idea is that um. 
um, yeah, the, the name is a, is a perceptual problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea here is that, um, so in, in the act of perception, we, we, um, produce or invent this, um, this compatibility, uh, and, and generate a, a form, but this is not sort of a permanent achievement. Uh, so it's something we, we can forget. We can have a perceptual skill, um, or an ability to perceive certain, uh, objects or certain types of objects or something like that. And then later on, we can lose that skill. We can, uh, no longer be able to identify, uh, say like, a uh, a type of bird, for example, uh, like bird watchers, uh, people who are, uh, you know, serious about birds, they, they can identify a bird just from its, its pattern of flight or, uh, you know, seeing it from below or something like that. Whereas the rest of us just see, you know, that's a bird, but they can, they can identify which type of bird it is, uh, just from, you know, very, very minimal, uh, cues. Uh, so that's a, a skill that you can learn a perceptual skill and, uh, uh, it's also something you can forget. You can, if you are, are a serious bird watcher for a couple of years and then you give it up and uh, maybe try to pick it up again 10 years later, you'll, you'll find that you, uh, you've you lost some of your perceptual skill and you have to sort of re, uh, relearn it. So I think that's the type of phenomenon that he's talking about here when he says about you can have a, a degradation of, uh, of the, the forms in perception. Uh, so it's it's a a kind of process of losing a perceptual skill. Um, yeah. So Luno has a, a question about um, what what Simon uh, what Simon Don thinks about constancies. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what kind of constancies you you have in mind. Uh, oh, okay, right. Yes. So uh, size constancy or color constancy. So this uh, is a, a psychological phenomenon, um, which is that um, or a, a set of psychological phenomena. Um, so you, for example, if you see um, a, a car um, from close up, from you know, from three feet away or from a hundred feet away, it still looks car sized. Like it still looks, you still judge it to have the same size, um, even though of course the retinal image uh, of the car is much smaller when it's a hundred feet away than when it's three feet away. Uh, so um, you you have. Um, Somehow in perception, we are able to capture the real size of an object, even though the, uh, the retinal image uh, of the object is, is uh, variable depending on how far away it is. Uh, and likewise, we, we have um, color constancy. So if you see something, if you see um, a piece of paper or a, a you know, page of a book or something under sunlight, uh, the the light reflected from the page is um uh, uh white light um you know the, the the same color as sunlight basically aside from the uh the black ink marks but then if you turn on um an incandescent light then it has a, a yellow hue uh, and then the light reflected from the the page will be also uh, have that yellow hue but we still perceive the page as white even whether it's uh under under the sunlight or under an incandescent light, we still have the same perception of the white page. And so we, we somehow, in perception, we were able to sort of factor out the color of the illumination and then see the, the real color of the object or, or what we perceive as the real color of the object, um, independent of the, the variations of illumination. And, uh, and, and yeah, so that there's a, there are other types of, of constancy as well uh, in other, um, like uh, in in perception of sound, uh, there are different constancies and, and so on. Um, I'm just trying to think if Simon Don talks about these capacities at all. Possibly in, so there there are um, some more psychological type texts from Simon Don that were published in the, the bulletin of the um, association of, the French Association of, of Psychology. Um, and uh, I haven't read all of those texts, so it's possible that he talks about some of this there. But um, yeah, I think in each of these cases, he would want to um, say he want he would want to say that this constancy that we um, perceive is is something is an achievement. It, it's it's not something that's sort of pre given to us. It's not um, it's not that uh, so the sort of naive conception of, of this process would be something like you know the car 
uh, in reality has a certain size and uh, we, we just see the size of the car. And, and that's, uh, that's sort of like the, the naive um, picture of, of what the, the process is like. But the fact that the, the retinal image through which or by means of which we see the car uh, varies in size shows that it, it has to be something more complicated than that. And, and so we have to think of we have to think of size constancy and color constancy and so on as, as achievements of perception. So um, the perception of a, of a color is a, a problem that we, we solve in perception by, um, we can say, factoring out the uh, color of the illumination uh, and, and uh, producing something like a constant color. Um, it might seem sort of counterintuitive uh, to our, um, maybe a, a more straightforward account of uh, uh, perception, uh, but I think I think this is um, an account that is is more grounded in the um, the psychological um, uh, research on perception rather than um, sort of a um, as you mentioned, you know, folk psychological categories. Uh, so it's it's meant to be a, a, a sort of revision of our um, our psychological concepts, and not is not meant to um, necessarily capture the way that we experience or or think of these um, phenomena in our everyday life. Right, and Angus wanted to confirm uh, so this discovery of a compatibility is signification. I think I think the way he would put it is that. Signification is what uh, underlies the discovery of compatibility. It's it's what precedes it and makes it possible. So if it's it's only because the perceptual situation is structured in such a way that um, the subject can uh, receive something from the object uh, that we can sort of by analogy describe as a, a message uh, and and incorporate it into its functioning. Um, so yeah, the signification is is the the state of the the situation prior to um, the act of perception, right? And and maybe um, Luno, maybe the um, the reason why this maybe seems a little bit, um, as I said, counterintuitive. Um, so whenever we see object here, we should think perceptual object. Um, so Simon Don is is specifically talking about the object as um, a, a perceived en- entity rather than the object uh say as it is in itself so so um he wants to account for the way that um the car uh in our visual fields uh uh it comes to be structured as an object as a as an individual uh, so the the object in this sense is just one one pool of the perceptual relationship um so it, it's it's internal to perception um and and um, so here he's he's not really um, he's not really talking about um, the car itself. He's he's talking about how the car um, the car in the perceptual um, relationship uh, how it appears in the perceptual relationship. I don't know if that if that sort of helps um, with the difficulty. Um, but I think yeah, I think whenever we see object, we should think perceptual object. Thanks. Yeah, I think it'll become a little bit clearer as we progress, just trying to pick at parts as we go along. Thank you. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go on to the next um, subsection here. So someone else would like to read from uh, Topic 260. Psychical tension and the degree of metastability, good form and geometrical form, the different types of equilibrium. Perception would therefore be an act of individuation comparable to those in physics and biology. But for us to be able to consider perception in this way, we must introduce a term that could be called psychical tension, or better yet, degree of metastability, because the first expression has already been used to designate a reality that is quite different, insofar as it does not begin with the notion of crisis. Consequently, The laws of good form are not sufficient to explain the segregation of units in the perceptive field. Indeed, they do not consider that perception is a solution contributed to a problem. These laws apply for the transformation and degradation of forms more so than their genesis. 
In particular, many laboratory experiments that use a fairly relaxed, perfectly secure subject do not produce the conditions under which the genesis of forms takes place. We should note the ambivalent characteristic of the notion of good form. Oh, okay. Uh, some mic issues. Um, uh, I can uh, I can pick up from there, uh, and then you can take the next one. Or Sorry, is your mic working now? Yeah, my apologies. Oh yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, Sorry. We should note the ambivalent characteristic of the notion of good form. A form like the circle or the square easily emerges from a web of incoherent lines upon which it is superimposed as an image. But, in spite of their simplicity, is the circle or square superior to a form invented by an artist? If this were true, the most perfect column would be a cylinder. On the contrary, according to de Vignola's orders, the most perfect column is a rotating figure that is both narrowed down and reduced at both ends as well as a non-symmetrical relative to its center, with the largest diameter situated below the middle of its height. The author of this work considers the proportions he gives to be the result of a veritable invention that was unachievable for the ancients. The ancient art architects also thought of themselves as inventors, and Vitruvius shows how the three classical orders were successively invented under conditions in which the prior forms were inadequate. It is necessary to establish a distinction between form and information. A form like the square can be quite stable, pregnant, and contain a small quantity of information in the sense that it can only very rarely incorporate different elements of a metastable situation. It is difficult to discover the square as a solution to a perceptive problem. The square or the circle, or more generally, all simple and pregnant forms, are structural schemas rather than forms. It may be that these structural schemas are innate, but they are not sufficient to explain the segregation of units in perception. The human figure with its friendly or hostile expression and the form of an animal with its typical external characteristics are just as pregnant as the circle or the square. In his work, Animal Forms and Patterns, Portman notes that the perception of a lion or a tiger does not fade away, even if it takes place only once and in a young child. This supposes that the simple geometrical elements do not matter much. It would be very difficult to define the form of the lion or tiger and the patterns of their skin using geometrical figures. In reality, there is a relation between a very young child and an animal that does not seem to borrow from the good forms of perceptive schemata. The child shows an astonishing aptitude for recognizing and perceiving the different parts of the body in animals that he sees for the first time. Even though the very slight similarity between the human form and the form of these animals forces us to rule out the hypothesis of an external analogy between the human form and animal forms. What is in fact engaged in this perception is the corporeal schema of the child in a situation deep, deeply suffused with fear or sympathy. What is structured into a perception of the animal's corporeal schema is the tension, the degree of metastability, of the system formed by the child and the animal in a determined situation. Here, perception grasps not just the form of the object, but its orientation within the ensemble, its polarity, which determines whether it is lying down or standing on its legs, whether it stands tall or takes flight, and whether it adopts a hostile or trusting attitude. If there were no preliminary tension or potential, perception wouldn't be able to produce a segregation of units that is simultaneously the discovery of the polarity of these units. The unit is perceived when the reorientation of the perceptive field can be effectuated in line with the object's own polarity. To perceive an animal is to discover the cephalocaudal axis and its orientation. To perceive a tree is to see it in the axis that goes from its roots to the end of its branches. Every time the tension of the system cannot be resolved into a structure, into an organization of the subject's polarity and of the object's polarity, 
an uneasiness remains that habit is hard pressed to destroy, even if every threat has been removed. And there's a footnote at the end of that before it begins the next section. Yeah, the the bit about the tiger, we can uh, think of, of Blake there. Um, there's also, I don't know if anyone else knows this, um, there's the, um, I think, I don't know where it came from originally, but there there was a, a tweet that I've seen go around many times of like some six-year-old's poetry contest uh, where this kid writes this poem about the tiger uh, escaping from the cage. Yes. Uh, the tiger, the tiger is out, uh, and it, it's, it's like, I don't know, there's something beautiful about that poem, but how it just captures so simply, um, the, the, the power of a, of a tiger. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone, uh, can find that quickly and, and post it in, in the chat for those who haven't seen it. But, um, yeah, anyway, I thought that was a, <laughs> a, a funny, um, uh, there we go. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so the tiger, he destroyed his cage. Yes, yes, the tiger is out. That's it. That's the poem. Um, yeah, so it, it, I think it just illustrates the way that um, children, uh, as Simon Don is, is, is talking about here, children have this um, very uh, uh, sort of immediate perception of, of animals um, in a way that it's it's hard to sort of um, uh, it's hard to sort of reduce it to something like uh, uh, an analogy between the human body and uh, an animal body because uh, you know a tiger is uh, the the shape of a tiger if you're just doing sort of geometrical shapes is very different from the shape of a human being so it's not like um, it's not like the the child um, sort of maps the the tiger's shape onto a human shape um it's something more um dynamic i guess than that so uh Simono talks about the the corporeal schema of the child so this is the body as uh as it's perceived in in action um rather than uh the body um as uh as seen from outside uh, as a geometrical shape or something like that um so the the child uh, recognizes the front and, and back um, of the animal insofar as, as the front is the direction of movement and uh, the, the back is the uh, direction uh, away from which the animal moves. Uh, and, and so they, 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 they're capable of um, perceiving the animal uh, they, through this uh, structuring of perception in terms of the axis that, that runs uh, from front to back, uh, from the, the head of the animal to the, the tail. Yeah, so this, for Simon Don, this shows that um, what, what, is, um, a, what is a good form or, or what is a, a something that has um, a power as a form is not reducible to simple geometrical figures in the way that the, the Gestalt school tried to, um, tried to describe it. Uh, so the the picture of the triangle uh, or a circle or something like that stands out from uh if it's covered in the in other lines or something like that um so it, it does have this um perceptual power uh but uh we we have the the same phenomenon it occurred even more strongly in the case of a, a human face or um uh the body of, a, of an animal or, or any other uh living form um so we 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 can we can see a, a human face even if it's covered by a mask, for example. Um, we we still see we still see it as a human face, and uh, and and that the the form of the human face uh, is a, a a good form in the sense that it uh, it's one that that the um, the human. Uh, perceptual apparatus will will tend to um, come to rest on and and another example that Simon Don uses um, is uh, it's still a, a much simpler um, example than a human face but um, when when you look at um, columns that are uh, in uh, in sort of classical architecture it's not just a, a, a pure cylinder um, if you if you built um, like if you look at um, like a parking garage where they actually do use a, a, a pure cylinder, uh, the columns look 
um, sort of, well, ugly in general. They, they just look purely functional. They don't have any aesthetic value. Whereas the columns on a, a, a Greek temple, for example, um, they're uh, slightly narrower at the ends than they are in, in the middle. So there's a, a sort of tapering effect. Uh, and also the the center of gravity, uh, so the widest point of the column is slightly below, uh, slightly below the midpoint of the column. So it's not symmetrical vertically, and uh, and this was uh, sort of discovered uh, experimentally, I guess, by architects in in classical Greek times, where they sort of worked on. Uh, probably started from like scale models or something like that, but eventually uh, came to realize that this uh, form of a column was uh, more aesthetically pleasing than uh, uh, just a purely a pure cylinder. Um, and you know came to sort of perfect the the proportions of a of a column. and uh, and so this um, this architectural column, uh, the one that's tapered and, and asymmetrical, is actually uh, a better form in the sense that um, our, our perception tends to um, sort of come to rest on that form. And uh, uh, it, 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 that form uh, serves as a, as a solution to, the, to a perceptual problem even more so than the pure cylinder does. And so for Simon Don, this shows that um, we have to have a, a more um, uh, a more dynamic and more complex understanding of what it means for a form to be a good form rather than just purely geometrical figures. Uh, and then there's this notion, he, he just sort of introduces it in, in passing right at the beginning of the section um, where he talks about a crisis. Um, and we'll see more on this later on, but he, he mentions how in psychological experiments, um, they, they're they generally um, relatively uh, low intensity operations. You have a, a, a first year psych student or, or someone uh, uh, off the street or whatever um, sitting in a chair and they have to press a button when they see a triangle or something like that. Um, uh, relatively low stakes and, and not something that you're sort of uh, involved in and doesn't have a, a real emotional um, tension or um, uh, involvement of the subject. And, and Simon Dono argues that this is not really um, characteristic of perception in the particular sense uh, that he wants to use this term. So the, uh, the generation of forms, uh, the genesis of forms, uh, doesn't occur in, in this sort of um, low tension situation. It, it occurs when uh, there's a uh, a high degree of tension. So there's a, um, whether it's fear or um, sympathy or any other sort of emotional reaction to um, the phenomenon, uh, the, the child that sees a tiger for the first time is, is going to be afraid or, or excited or, or something, uh, not just sort of passively perceiving uh, a, a series of shapes on a screen or something like that. Um, we have... Uh, uh, this this genesis of forms occurs in a, a situation of high uh, emotional tension and and not in uh, the low low tension uh, states that are normally the case in laboratory settings. I wanted to ask uh, briefly what you thought um, is the situation as far as the subject's recognition of the crisis or the psych psychical tension, um, how that is kind of rendered from the perspective of the individual if um the crisis and therein the solution um to be hashed out and found is something that the subject is consciously experiencing or something that is subservient to the perceptual apparatus which a subject might find to just be transient and otherwise uninvolved yeah that's a that's a good question um i think he would want to distinguish between sort of degrees of tension um so, um, low, so a lower degree of tension, um, uh, a situation with a lower degree of tension, um, like the the one where uh, you have the the first year psych student sitting in a, a lab setting and and just watching a screen. Um, in in that type of situation, the uh, 
the perceptual structuring of the situation um, would be so uh, so uh, sort of low stakes or low tension that it would probably um, uh, happen without the awareness of the the person themselves. Um, so there's uh, like I don't know if the task is to um, see triangles behind different types of obstacles or or you know press a button whenever you recognize a triangle. Um, that that task is is pretty um yeah just low stakes and and would would probably be be performed without any sense of uh tension arising in the subjects themselves um um whereas in a uh a more um intense uh perceptual situation or a situation in which there's more tension uh, that tension will come to be, uh, the, the subject will be aware of that tension in, in the form of an emotional state. Uh, so they, they'll be scared or, or happy or excited or right. whatever the, the specific um, uh, feeling is. Right. So this is kind of like uh, maybe the counter example would be uh, being lost in the woods as a young boy, maybe, and having to find a path out, maybe. Uh... And maybe that stressful situation would um, be a rise to the challenge of um, sort of segregating maybe the shapes of the trees or 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 trees that might have predators or um, land formations that give to maybe like a trapdoor sort of leaves on the ground you fall in. Essentially, the the perceptual tension is real uh, psycho emotional tension. Uh, you feel is what Sim Simon is is. Um, is arguing here you think yeah so in in that um example that, that's, a, that's a good example of uh, uh, a high tension psychical situation um so yeah you're lost in the woods you're trying to find you know what's the path uh, to get out and and you know what what um what objects or or things should i avoid um and uh in this situation uh so i think i think you would have um well yeah so the the sense of tension or the the sense of uh, a crisis would be would be um uh apparent to the subject so the the child who's lost in the woods would feel that fear or the confusion and 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 everything um about being lost um so it would be uh um sort of obvious to them that they're in a state of of crisis um but uh there would also be sort of um it can, it, I think it would, would, would go sort of one of two ways, depending on um, how sort of prepared the, the child is for this experience. So if, if they have some, uh, you know, if they're in uh, scouts or something and they've learned about how to navigate in the woods, they might, they might the, the experience of being lost might sort of heighten their perception of uh, the phenomena that they need to find uh, so uh the path to get out or the uh uh traps to avoid and so on um they they would have a sort of um heightened awareness of of these phenomena whereas the child who is completely unprepared uh would probably be overwhelmed by the uh complexity of the of the perceptual task um and and the tension of the situation uh uh and and so i think um I think it would probably be sort of one of one of those two phenomena is is what you would find uh in that case yeah and um and, and so that example also uh this is not something that, that someone don't really gets into here um but uh it, it shows that this uh perceptual task is something that we don't necessarily succeed at, at uh at performing um so we can we can fail to perceive something uh uh, you know, this happens all the time, of course, when you're looking for your keys or whatever, and, and you uh, you look all around the house, and then you find that they were sitting like right on top of the table, uh, and you, you just didn't you didn't see them. Um, so so we can we can um, fail to discriminate something in perception, uh, even if it's um, uh, even if there is a, a high degree of tension, and, and it's something that we we uh, very much want to be able to see um it uh uh it we don't necessarily succeed in these tasks um so it's it's not uh, we're not guaranteed to to be successful but don't 
uh, two things that came to my mind, like uh, regarding the parts we have read so far. The first thing is that, like, um, I think this part is like the uh, the 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 moment, like, uh, to break uh, Plato's tradition, like, um, so like, um, not that the uh, whole images are not not the like uh, the reflection of the idea. Um, so, like, uh, in terms of a form, form and matter, um, it can be about uh, nothing is like a uh, destined or decided. And then uh, it can uh, be uh, kind of perceived um, according to like uh, uh, different individuals, like the potentials or whatsoever. So, uh, so I am wondering, like, uh, anybody who grabbed that kind of idea, like, if you go back to Aristotle or Plato, and then that kind of like you know. The, in terms of like a forms and then the 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 the, um, the the relation between the form and matter and then plus um, I mean in this sense like I mean in this part like the relationship is quite important I mean it really emphasizes like in in terms of relations like the form even like it can be um, decided at the end of the day like according to the who who says lion who says tiger. Um, maybe like there is no particular shape of tiger, so because like um, according to the different perception, it could be uh, perceived differently, something like that. And the secondly, like the um, the Simongda pointed out the <clears throat> transformation and the degradation. So um, the change doesn't go to the like the direction of entropy. So it goes down to the negentropy. Actually, he would uh, discuss that later or another book the point is that like uh i think the 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 direction of change it's quite interesting point because like we normally like we think like uh in terms of a change we think like uh, the direction of a plus like direction of improvement things like that. uh but at the end of the day like it 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 can go downward like it goes a different way and, and collectively Maybe it goes uh, uh, some toward like uh, some some particular direction, something like that. So it gives us, I mean, it gives at least to me like uh, to uh, think. I mean, the whole kind of transformation, a whole kind of change of metastables phase could be thought at another level, like not the individual level, and not only in, in individual level, but also in collective level at the end of the day. Yeah, that that that's the two points I thought of. If anybody who um who thinks like um a little similarly or differently. Yeah, um, those are some some interesting uh, points, and I think um, one one part in particular where where you you talked about how um, um, the the perception would can vary from one individual to another. Um, I think that's an important point. Um, and, and it's also something that Simono doesn't, doesn't talk about too much really in this, um, in this passage, but, um, um, yeah. So in the situation of the child seeing the, the tiger for the first time, um, uh, you, you'll have different, um, responses, you know, some, some children will be afraid. Some will be excited. Some will, uh, I don't know, be be happy, or or you might have, uh, you know, every every child will have a, a different experience of of the the tiger, um, and and what that means for uh, uh, for them. Uh, and so perception. Um, uh, so as Simondo describes here, it's it's uh, it's a relationship between. Um, between an object and a subject, uh, and so it's it's always um, particular to that subject, uh, and and so we in our perception we um, we uh, we're always related to uh, an object that is specific to us. Uh, so each each object has their own, um, uh, or sorry, each each subject has their own perceptual object. Um, um, and uh, uh, their own uh, problem to solve in perception. Uh, so it's it's uh, partic particular to each subject. 
and then the 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 second point where you talked about um how this can sort of lead into a uh, discussion of, of the collective. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's right. Um, and we'll see that in the next part of the book on, on the collective uh, individuation. But um, I think we can probably think of situations where um, being part of a group uh, changes our perceptual um, set, I guess we can say, or, or our perceptual awareness. Um, like, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if this is a good example, but... Um, being at a concert, uh, you know, in a in an audience and and experiencing uh, music in in a group setting is is a very different experience than listening to to a recording of the concert um, at home on your own. Um, so you you your awareness of being part of a group uh, changes the way you perceive the the music, uh, even if you have exactly the same. Um, sounds recorded and, and replayed to you afterwards uh uh so you you perceive something different in or or, or what you perceive is is a, a somewhat different um perceptual object when you're in that collective setting than when you're in a uh just on your own um so i think yeah i think that's one way that um this analysis of perception uh sort of feeds into uh, an understanding of collective individuation. Uh, but yeah, we'll see more on that um, when we get to that part. Yeah, yeah. So I, what, I, what I wanted to stress was like an entropy, like the, uh, the direction of energy or the direction of like the transformation. And then maybe like your orchestra, maybe like that's kind of a, like a very interesting example because like some, my part, even though my part is gone, going away, that the uh, orchestra, the music goes on, because like I mean that that kind of thing, and then like here, um, Petruvius, like a Roman architect, he uh, made a uh, three uh, particular rules of the uh, perfect perfect beauty, perfect um, architect, and then um, definitely like um, so long time ago, there must be some must have been some kind of ideal. Uh, image or ideal kind of um, form, like uh, the exact, I mean, very specific idea of uh, uh, exact, exact form, I mean, exactly beautiful form. So, but the, here, Simong Dong seem to more emphasize that um, maybe that doesn't exist. It's uh, too much, but I mean, just as, uh, as we have discussed so far, it's kind of like, uh, depends, it depends. And then, and then, Plus, I'm I'm wondering how how you think like uh, the meaning of the polarity here, the last part of the, I mean, uh, the last part of the uh, section, um, Simong Dong used the word like a uh, subject and objects so on polarity. Polarity definitely influenced uh, some kind of this kind of forming perceptions and things like that. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot in in that um, comment, uh, um, but. Yeah, so this notion of polarity, um, to start there, um, so what he's thinking of uh, in particular is in the case of perception of an animal where you, in, in perceiving an animal, you, you um, identify the front and back uh, or uh, privileged directions of the animal. Um, uh, so the perception of the animal is not just as a, a geometrical shape, but as something that has... Um, a front and a back, uh, and and uh, what that means for for the animal as a um, as a, a living being, and and so for Simon Dong, uh, this is a, a an example of um, this is an example of the way that we structure um, perception in general. So in, in the case of the tree, we we structure it in terms of the the axis that goes from the roots to the branches. Um, uh, in the case of any object, we, we, we don't just perceive it as, um, as a geometrical shape, sort of neutrally in space. We, uh, we perceive it as uh, an object that has a front and a back or a top and a bottom or, or some sort of directionality built into it. Um, and, and so this um, dynamic quality to perception or, or this polarization of perception is a... Uh, is, uh, um, uh, a problem to be, or is is the result of a, a problem-solving operation. So we we only 
we only see something as having a front and a back um, after having solved the, the perceptual problem that the object presents to us. Um, so that's that's sort of what he means by polarity there. Um, and I think we can also tie it in with some of the uh, earlier discussion. I forget exactly where it was, but uh, probably a month or two ago now, um, where where he talked about um, uh, tropisms and uh, the way that um, in in uh, tropisms you have um, living beings that are oriented towards a gradient in their environment, whether it's uh, oriented to towards light or away from light, or um, uh, you have organisms that swim upstream uh, uh, along uh, a, a gradient of concentration of sugar. Um, uh, some feature of the environment uh, um, is sort of polarized in this way for the organism. So this is like a, a basic perceptual, um, or, or even prior to perception, um, uh, a, a basic um, relationship to the environment uh, that that uh, all living beings have in some way, um, and and our um, perceptual structuring of uh, an, uh, an object into a front and a back is like a more um, a more developed or more complex form of the same type of structuring as in the case of tropisms. Ah, so I, I thought that polarity may be like an equivalent to, to singularity, but you understand the polarity as a kind of a topological meaning, like a front and back and some, something like that. So you can guess the form of the something. That's what you are thinking, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, top, we can we can also tie it back to the the discussion of topology in the previous um, the previous section. Um, um, yeah, so um, that structuring of a situation into um, um, into uh, directions that are not homogeneous, I think, is is what he has in mind when he talks about polarity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, right, and, and Ken has posted a, a video of a slime mold time lapse. Um, so this, uh, I guess, is a, an instance of uh, tropism, if if I'm not mistaken, uh, where they uh, will move uh, in accordance with a, or, or the the mold will grow in in uh, accordance with a gradient in the environment. Is that uh, the idea that you had with uh, with posting that? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and yeah, like lots of there's there's all kinds of different um, um, microorganisms that will swim upstream towards the higher concentration of uh, of sugar or whatever other nutrients that they uh, they need. Uh, and you have um, you know fish that will follow a, a gradient of uh, of uh, you know particular. Um, uh, chemicals to so, so that they can find the um, uh, their nesting sites or whatever. Um, so all, all throughout the the world of living beings, there is a uh, this capacity to um, respond to a gradient in the environment is, is a, a sort of fundamental um, capacity that that all living beings have in some way or another. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next uh, subsection. Uh, if someone else would like to read, um, uh, starting from subsection three. A relation between the segregation of perceptive units and the other types of individuation, meta metastability, and information theory and technology and psychology. The psychological uh, problem of the segregation of perceptive units indicates a fact that had been perfectly revealed by the founders of Gestalt theory. Individuation is not a process that is restricted to a single domain of reality. For example, that of psychological reality or physical reality. This is why any doctrine is insufficient if it limits itself to privileging a field of reality in order to turn it into the principle of individuation, whether it be the domain of psychological reality or that of material reality. It may even be possible to say that there is individualized reality only in a mixture. In this sense, 
we will attempt to define the individual as transductive reality. By transductive reality, we mean the individual is neither a substantial being like an element, nor a pure rapport, but the reality of a metastable relation. There is no um, veritable individual except in a system in which a metastable state occurs. If the appearance of the individual makes its metastable state disappear by reducing the tensions of the system in which it appears, the individual becomes in its entirety a motionless and non-evolving spatial structure. The physical individual... On the other hand, if this appearance of the individual does not destroy the system's potential of metastability, then the individual is a living being, and its equilibrium is that which maintains metastability. In that case, it is a dynamic equilibrium, which generally supposes a series of new successive structurations, without which the equilibrium of metastability could not be maintained. A crystal is like the fixed structure left by an individual that lived for a single instant. The instant of its formation, or rather the instant of the formation of the crystalline germ around which successive layers of microscopic crystalline um, network have clustered. The form that we encounter is merely the vestige of uh, individuation that was already achieved in a metastable state. The living being is like a crystal that would uh, maintain an ongoing metastability around it and in its relation to the milieu. This living being can be endowed with an indefinite life, as in certain extremely elementary forms of life. Or, on the contrary, it can be limited in its existence because its own structuration is opposed to the upkeep of an ongoing metastability of the ensemble formed by the individual and the milieu. Little by little, the individual loses its plasticity, its capacity to render situations metastable to turn them into problems with multiple solutions. It could be said that the living individual increasingly structures within itself and therefore tends to repeat its previous conditions as it moves further from its birth. In this sense, the limitation of a lifespan is not absolutely linked to individuation. It is merely the consequence of very complex forms of individuation, wherein the consequences of the past are not eliminated from the individual and provided with an instrument for resolving future difficulties and also with an obstacle for accessing new types of problems and situations. The successive characteristic of learning, the utilization of successiveness in the fulfillment of different functions, provides the individual with superior possibilities of adaptation, but requires an internal structuration of the individual that is irreversible and forces it to convert, conserve within itself along with the schemas discovered in the past situations, the determinism of these very situations. Only an individual whose transformations could be reversible, uh, would be reversible, could be considered immortal from the moment the functions of the succession of behaviors and the temp temporal sequences of act appear in an irreversibility that uh, specializes the individual becomes the consequence of this appearance of temporal laws. For each type of organization, there is a th threshold of irreversibility beyond which all progress made by the individual, every acquired structuration, is a chance of death. Only beings with a superficial innovation and a barely differentiated structure have no limit to their lifespan. These beings are generally also the ones for which it is the most difficult to determine the limits of the individual particularly when several individuals live in clusters or symbiotically. The degree of structural individuality which corresponds to the notion of a limit, to that of a boundary of one being which respect, uh, with respect to the other beings, or to that of an interior organization, is consequently to be put on the same level as the characteristic of temporal structuration that involves irreversibility, even though the former is not the direct cause of the latter. 
the common origin of these two aspects of the individual's reality seem to be, in fact, the process according to which metastability is conserved or increased in the individual's relation to the milieu. The essential problem of the biological individual would thus be relative to this characteristic of the metastability of the ensemble formed by the individual and the milieu. Yeah, so again, we have um, a lot a lot of different ideas in this uh, page or so that we just read. Um, so Simono introduces here again um, the, the notion of a, a transductive reality, uh, which we've seen throughout the um, throughout the, the book uh, in various um, different domains. Um, but here he gives us a, a definition, which is nice, um, or uh, not quite a definition, but but um, <clears throat> he he um, contrasts transductive reality with um, a substantial being um, of of something like an element uh, and pure rapport. Um, but he so he he characterizes uh, transductive reality as the reality of a metastable relation. Uh, so it's only insofar as uh, a system um, as this property of metastability that uh, that something like a transductive reality can appear in that system. Yeah, so um, metastability, we, we've discussed this before, but it may, it's it maybe been a little while since we talked about it. Um, so just as a reminder, so metastability means the capacity of a system to undergo further transformation. So it, it's in a provisionally stable state um, but it uh, it's still capable of undergoing further transformation as opposed to a a, um, a purely stable state in which um, there's no further capacity for transformation in the system. So the system in a metastable state still has potentials for further transformation. Um, and then we have this uh, this contrast between the individuation of a, a physical entity like the crystal. Uh, as opposed to as opposed to the individuation of um, uh, a living being, uh, uh, insofar as the the individuation of the crystal is something that happens instantaneously. Um, so there's uh, he he says here that it, it's um, it's as if the crystal were alive for a single instant, and then afterwards it. Uh, the crystal can only degrade um, or or um, undergo various other transformations, but it, it's not undergoing individuation anymore. Um, and yeah, so Angus has has um, uh, recalled this um, notion that we've seen before of uh, uh, vital individuation uh, as being uh, a form of neoteny in in comparison to physical physical individuation. So it's uh, it's a slowed down version of physical individuation, um, and and uh, so in in vital individuation, uh, the the system retains its metastability um, not just for that instant of individuation, but over time, um, so that um, uh, the the system, uh, the living being, and its its milieu. Um, uh, retains that property of uh, having potentials for further transformations um, within it, um, as opposed to the crystal that can only undergo um, degradation. Uh, and then we have this bit, uh, which is not really developed, um, but uh, this this idea that um, uh, we've seen uh, related ideas before, this idea that there's a relationship between um, the lifespan of an individual and its capacity to undergo individuation. Um, and, and so there's something in, in undergoing individuation, you are sort of using up uh, your potentials. Um, so life, life consists in uh, processes of individuation, but each of those... Um, uh, each of those processes of individuation is uh, um, using up some of the potentials that uh, the individual had, um, and and so there's a a sort of um, we saw uh, in the previous chapter the 
these two notions of death, the, the external notion and the internal notion. And so here we're talking about the internal notion of death, where the, the functioning of an organism, uh, its, its processes of individuation um, brings about its own death or, or um, brings it closer to death uh, over time. And, and so Simon Do argues here that the only type of um, the only type of individual that would be immortal would be one uh, in which all of the transformations would be reversible. So none, none of the transformations would be an individuation in the proper sense. Uh, so um, in the case of um, uh, certain uh, certain organisms uh, that live in these colony states, the, the colony can can be um, immortal because it uh, it it doesn't uh, undergo any uh, any processes of individuation. The the individual members of the colony can are born and die, uh, but the the colony as a whole uh, preserves its uh, its form over the course of the whole. Um, lifespan uh, or, or beyond the lifespan of the individuals that make it up any any uh being that undergoes individuation uh is necessarily mortal um uh for simon Don. it it's um will necessarily use up a certain uh portion of its potentials any time that it undergoes the process of individuation uh and angus has also um pointed out the connection with the death drive in Freud. Uh, and we saw um, probably about a month ago now, or, or six weeks maybe, um, that Simon Don did talk about Freud uh, and, and the death drive. And he, um, he had some reservations about, um, uh, yeah, so he, he introduced this contract, contrast between drives and instincts. And he had some reservations about Freud's account um, uh, because he thinks that it, he that Freud doesn't um, make uh, make the distinction um, clear enough between drives and instincts. Uh, so there would be certain um, uh, so the instincts would be uh, in relation to the being uh, insofar as it uh, uh, insofar as it uh, is part of the um, uh, ongoing lifespan of the individual, uh, and then drives would be. Um, in relation to reproduction and uh, and uh, the individual as a, an individual distinct from its social life, um, yeah. So uh, that would be probably worthwhile to go back to that section and to read it uh, in connection with with um, what's discussed here. Yeah, and and Luno, um, we we tend to our our general. Um, Target is two hours uh, for for time, so we will wrap it up in a minute here, um, in a couple minutes. Uh, but um, yeah, and and we'll post the uh, the page number for for next week. I sometimes forget to do that, but I try to um, I try to post where we end up each uh, each session, and uh, uh, then people can pick up from there next time. Uh, you don't need to read ahead if like uh, we'll, we as we did today we'll, we'll read through it uh, together um but if you want to read ahead that, that's always um uh, an option as well we yeah I, I would say we should probably end here rather than trying to rush through this last paragraph um um so we can we can pick up this uh, last paragraph of the of the subsection uh next time uh this chapter is relatively short so we might yeah, we probably won't finish next time, but maybe the time the the session after that we'll we'll finish it. Um, but uh, I think I think this one is a little bit um, a little bit easier to follow than some of the uh, some of the ones that uh, um, we've seen in in the last few weeks. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's let's end here. Um, thank you everyone for uh, showing up and for your participation, uh, and hopefully see you next week.